So we're joined today by T.D. Barnes, who served as a field engineer at the NASA High Range in Nevada for the X-15, the XB-70, lifting bodies and lunar landing vehicles. He also worked on the NERVA project at Jackson Flats, Nevada, and served in special projects at Area 51. He is the author of multiple books, including a three-volume book on Area 51 that was made for CIA. And you can find out a whole lot about what he's written and what he's done at his website, td-barnes.com. So, TD, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us here at SpyCast. My pleasure, man. So, I, when anyone ever has a, a long career doing intelligence work or things related to intelligence work, I like to ask how they got into it. Because in a lot of respects, there are people that kind of stumble and bumble their way into these jobs and don't realize necessarily that this is going to be a career for them. And then there are those who go into high school knowing that they want to do a certain job. I mean... They're the Kelly Johnsons of the world who could see air at 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who just kind of never even heard of the CIA before they had a conversation with them. Where do you fall into that spectrum? I said the CIA knocked on my door while I was in the Army. It was kind of an interesting way it came about. I was I served in the Army as Army Intelligence in Korea. And got into electronics, missiles, and radar at Fort Bliss, Texas. Went to one school watching another. Went, spent two and a half years doing that going to school, and uh, just one after another. And I became, you might say, top in my field. And the CIA had detected a new radar in Russia. And they're getting ready to build the A-12 that they're going to fly at Area 51, and they needed to know if this radar would enable the Russians to shoot down the A-12 that they that was going to replace the U-2. The Russians moved one. To, move the radar to Cuba, mm. and we knew about it. So the CIA and the NSA was flying ghost flights out of Beards Air Force Base at El Paso. And they was, what they did is probing the Russians in Cuba, make them turn on the radar, and they take a look at it, and it answered electronically, and they could make it think it's tracking 10 planes, one plane, coming in, going away, whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And they was able to uh, analyze this radar. And what they determined was, yes, the Russians were advancing fast enough that they would be able to shoot the plane down. And we never flew another flight over Russia. And but, this was trying to develop electronic countermeasures also to try to it. find ways to... I was very advanced into counter measures and counter, uh, counter countermeasures. And the, um, uh, the uh, Army was getting ready to deploy the Hawk missile one to Cuba, Key West, Florida, mm -hmm. for the Cuban thing. You know, we hadn't discovered the missiles yet right. in Cuba. This was before that. And also one to Europe for the um, Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain. And the, we did not have the ECM, the current ECM that the Russians were using in their mid-15s. So the CIA approached me to go on a flight, a couple of flights in the ghost plane out of Biggs. And we would make the Russians think we had a missile locked on them, so they'd turn on their ECM. And we was how, how, how we were able to get the ECM to, to program our missiles to defend against it. Right, so you basically were bait. We were bait. We, we flew up in C-97. I flew two missions. My wife did not know about this until <laughs> I recent, bet, right? Yeah. recent years. So they went that far from, from El Paso to Cuba. And, you know, that had jumped in all places, and it still is, mm -hmm. for anything in Central America, South America, or Cuba. Columbia in place. And uh, so I get up in the morning, leave, and go out there and hop on this uh, ghost plane and take off. It's full of electronics, the antennas all over. And w once we got what we wanted, of course, they would launch the MiGs, they'd turn on the radar, they scared the death of us when we did start a war. Mm -hmm. and, but anyway, we, we coordinated this with the Air Force at Homestead, and they'd launch a couple of F 100s, and they'd get between us and the MiGs, and we could haul back. Right. Go, go back, go back. Yeah, you were going <laughs> to say haul ass back. You can say that. It's okay. We have, we have adults that listen. So, but, but that was my first introduction to the program at, at Area 51. However, I wasn't told that it was Area 51. Right. You know, no need to know. But that was my introduction to the CIA. And then they tried to recruit me for uh, all kinds of things. They're after I stayed in contact. And then they, um, uh, when they actually already start flying the, the, Planes at Area 51, they, they signed me. I was picked up at, at NASA on the high range. And one of the seven sisters, the CIA had what they call the seven sisters, 
six of them was the Air Defense Command radar sites, and one was my site, mm -hmm. which was 65 miles near Area 51. And every time they had a flight at Area 51 then with an A-12, they would notify us we're going to have something flying today, monitor it, but don't re say anything or don't record it. And, and, that, and I had the only radar in the, that could track, the, the, actually physically track the A-12. So when they went through the Mark 1, Mark 2, and Mark 3 stages, they would call me up, we got something you want to, well, you want to I track I bet that was today. interesting. You're like, what's going yeah. on here? This is flying slightly faster. And, they, and uh, of course, I knew something was flying at Area 51 because I, I wasn't, radar was not my job there. I yeah. knew radar, but I was, I was actually a technical, I was above that. Mm -hmm. and, but, but I was the only one on site that had a clearance. Right. I came out of the Army, still had my clearance, and the agency made sure that I kept it. I was their go-to man within NASA on that site. And they, I get a call with you, got something you want you to track. We'd lock the doors to the radar room. I radar, tell the radar operator to go take a break. And we, I, I track the, uh, whatever they're tracking, and then hand them the uh, chart, the velocity chart when we got through. Was there an understanding at this time that there was a secret program happening in Nevada in somewhere that CIA was running? I mean, the U-2 had been flying for a little while. I mean. No one knew, really knew about Area 51 then. The, uh, everybody knew the facilities out there, but the AEC was a cover mm -hmm. on it, and also NASA. Right, it was the Nevada test site that was and, used for nuclear testing. And, and, right and it's interesting why they, why they picked Area 51 in Nevada for the U-2, the, um, and why they picked the CIA. You know, there was a lot of politics involved. The Air Force, General LeMay just flat refused to build a plane with one engine in it. And that did shoot guns and drop bombs. Right. I mean, uh, and we need and we need to know what the Russians are doing behind the Iron Curtain. We'd lost over 200 air crew in Russia. The Air Force had get shot down just trying try to get a photograph of what's going on. So anyway, so when they decided to to locate a site to tr to track the, the or test flight to you too, they picked Nevada because there's only 237,000 people in the whole state. And then um, during World War II, all the military services had moved from the West Coast to Nevada, made it the West Coast line of defense during World War II, thinking that the Japanese were going to capture the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So we had the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Forces all in Nevada. So what was one more little installation stuck right out in the middle of all of these? And they didn't make it a big secret about it. You said it's going to be NASA tr tracking a um, high altitude to the weather research. Good, good cover story. Well, and this is before Las Vegas turned into Las Vegas, yeah. right? Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, a, it's a, just a frontier. Yeah. And most people worked for the government back then. Right. Only, you know, the gambling wasn't big or anything like that. Well, I mean, that's, you know, right next to New Mexico also where there's a lot of basically government facilities that were top and secret there as well. Less than 5% of the people that ever worked at Area 51 knew the CIA was involved. Huh. Less than 5%. They had no. They didn't have a need to know. Right. My and and only the cadre. We were cadre. My group was twenty three of us. We were specialists in pro, special project. We could live here. So that, that was our base. But anyone else, they were the customer, and they couldn't even live in the state of Nevada. They they commuted out of Cap, mostly out of California. Even even your A twelve people, they, they they lived in Burbank in that vicinity. Right. And then they fly up every. Um, Monday morning or whenever on a, a C-47 or whatever. And right, like the people from Skunk Works and mm -hmm. others doing the yeah, Lockheed stuff. Yeah, exactly. So I, you had to commute to work in a very interesting way also. It's not like there was a super highway leading to Groom Lake. No, we went out on Monday morning, and I was kind of special. I flew up to Queen Air, and there was, and, and, um, but the wife would take me out to the, we had it parked on the end of McCarran. We had a little building there with a chain link fence around it, just didn't no signs or anything. And we kept the plane inside the building, we'd go out there and we'd push it out by hand, open the gate and push it out, hop aboard, just take off. So We're you could gone. avoid traffic because you flew to work every day. Mm -hmm. We flew, yeah. and then came home Friday night. We stayed up there all week. And um, it was, um, anyone that ever worked up there, they'll tell you it's the best assignment they ever had, even though you used up there, the, hard, the hardships. But the food was best in the world. There's no food better. I mean, they took care of us. Yeah. And well, you would think that, I mean, since the cadre was so small, and I think this is obvious now because you do have, like, Roadrunners International and where mm -hmm. 
there, there's a, a bit of a fraternity of people who worked out there who all kind of went through the same thing together and were clear to the same levels. Well, and what was interesting when you got out there, they, you know, like the um, pilots and all that, they couldn't even come in my building because we was working on some other projects. Right. And, then, and even within my group, we would have different customers would help each other. You knew basically what the other was doing. And you help him out if you need to hand with something, but you didn't ask questions. Who are you doing this for? Or how's it work? Right. Or, you know, and we still don't. There's some things that we know has not been declassified, and we still don't talk about it. Well, I mean, you're talking about counterintelligence in this case, but you also have to be worried about things like Soviet satellite reconnaissance and, and other things. Because it, oh, oh, this yeah. is the most top secret facility in the United States. The Soviet Union, you was there. Yeah. And they, they, we call them ash cans. They had not launched a satellite. Of course, there wasn't that many satellites in those days. Yeah. But they, but we'd get a, a, a roster a security to give it to us in the morning. Here's what they launched last night. Here's what's coming over. And we knew the times. And we would, um, we knew if, if it's RF seeking, and we shut down all emissions, or if it's infrared, we would have to move everything off the, the outside, moved in a hoot scoot shed or hangar or something like that. So you, you know, maybe people would push an A12 inside of a hangar if they knew the satellite was going over the top. Exactly. Or... <laughs> and, it, and it's really a pain because we were doing, you know, stealth was CIA was really into stealth. The A12 was the first stealth plane. Mm -hmm. And we had it on the pole with a pylon for 16 months. Maybe do radar cross-section testing. Exactly. Yeah. And the uh, and every time satellites were coming over, if it was infrared, we would have to move the, take the plane off the pole, hide it. And we didn't find out many, many years later that when the Russians started declassifying stuff, they was able, they knew the exact shape of that plane all along because it, it left a shadow on the dead, on the deck bed. And the infrared picked up the shadow of it. They knew the exact shape of it. Well, I, yeah, I imagine if you've got a 110 degree day, mm -hmm. that shadow would be at least 15, 20 degrees different. Exactly. You're certainly going to yeah. get a different it, thermal signature from that. Exactly. So they knew the exact shape. They knew what was doing. Even though you didn't physically get to see the uh, uh, see the plane. Well, it didn't help that. them figure out how to shoot it down because no. Uh, no. the A12 and its and its sister plane, the SR71, just extraordinary. I've, I've spoken. We I did a podcast with I don't know Buzz Carpenter, who was a yeah, SR71 yeah. pilot. Yeah, um, who uh, they talked about the the countermeasures to being fired at it wasn't to maneuver, it wasn't to launch flares, it was to speed up. Mm -hmm. Right. It was basically in less. Yep. We speed. outrun the missiles. Yep. Yeah, they shot. They shot. We we flew, flew during Black Shield. We flew twenty six missions over uh, North Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and they'd shoot missiles at us. And they would sometimes they would shoot past the plane and then actually lock onto it and catch up with it. When the proximity fuse went off, the plane was going so fast it outrun the the explosion. <laughs> and the only one that the only Blackbird, including the SR seventy one, that ever got hit with a missile was Dennis Sullivan in A twelve. He landed at, at uh, Cadena, and they found a little piece of shrapnel hmm. embedded in the plane. They got it at CIA headquarters now. It, that's the only, miss, only missile there, piece of missile there, ever struck Blackbird. And it's extraordinary because the engineering of this aircraft was so ahead of its time. Oh, right. And the fact that very few of them were lost, I mean, one of them was lost to the tag board trials where the drone basically threw through the back of the aircraft. Exactly, yes. How close, because actually a co-pilot was lost in that, uh, died in that actual. Um, yeah, Ray Tork. Yeah, uh, Bill the, Park was a pilot. Yeah, was yeah, that. yeah, the M21, most of the M21, right. D21 the D21 drone. was the tag board. Yeah. That had to have been, I mean, again, this, this fraternity of just these people who were very few and who spent a lot of time together on Monday through Friday, right? Mm. The, the kind of camaraderie that was created at this must have been extraordinary. My my group, we either had a, 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 a cruiser on Lake Mead, we had a cabin on Mount Charleston, and that's something we had in common, and we could plan and talk all week, and then we spent the entire weekend on the lake, my my group did, mm -hmm. We and we'd take the families out there, the wives made sure there's no honeydew stuff for us to do, they had all the chores done, mm -hmm. so we'd immediately head for the lake. But what is very, very interesting is there was no divorces. Absolutely no divorce. Well, what's interesting is you mentioned this also on your website that unlike a lot of these secret projects that CIA did where they were looking for single men and for people that didn't have a familiar tie and didn't have any mm -hmm. kind of... They actually recruited you because you were married, because you had kids, exactly. because they understood the family 
home environment was stable and it was something that would, I guess you'd be more psychologically adept to doing these kinds of operations. Yeah, you know, serial guys are like Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we didn't need that. Right, well, and that's the one really interesting thing also about not all the engineers, the pilots, everybody, everyone's kind of nondescript, right? It's not like mm. no one's walking in with a call sign Maverick, right? They're just normal guys who, I mean, Bill Parks is a great example of this, right? This guy yeah. is just, if you saw him in the street, you would not say he had flown oh, that's some right. of the most amazing aircraft ever made and crashed half of them because he was a test pilot. Oh, yeah, Bill yeah. Parks had more time yeah. than anyone I know. <laughs> Another was interesting one was Jack Layton that flew the A-12, the agency pilot. He jumped out of three different planes that was on fire. And one of them landed, he landed in Everglades, spent the night with alligators and rattlesnakes. Another was in the Pacific, took all night for the Coast Guard to find him. And then the third one was the YF-12, caught on fire at uh, Edwards. And we actually got a video of it, the entire flight. They, they had a camera at Edwards that was able to track that plane. You see the, the engine on fire. And they, of course, the pilots are talking. They cleared the area, and then when they it burnt through the hydraulics. So, so Jack and his RSO had to jump out. And just by coincidence, you know, the camera's still on the plane. Both parachutes goes right through the frame <laughs> as they're coming down. It, it, you couldn't have planned that. If you, you couldn't have planned to, it. Right? Absolutely not. Well, I, as an engineer, as somebody who's kind of you know obviously loves building, it had to have been. There's no better place on earth for high-tech, cutting-edge engineering than Area 51 at this time? Area 51, to me, of course, coming off the NASA high range, uh, Area 51 was very boring. Okay. Because the NASA high range, we were doing the Area 15, the Area 70, right. the YF-12, the A-12 occasionally, and if, every day was, and these were nail biters, the Area 15, we weren't testing planes, it was a workhorse. Right. And what, everything that went to the moon in Apollo, we tried it first in the Area 15. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And so it was a very dynamic um, work schedule. And we got out to the area, and particularly when we started doing stealth at your arch cart, they'd bring a prototype out for us to look at, the RCS on, uh, radar cross-section on. And we may not, may not hear from them for another three months. Mm -hmm. And we were out there all week. So we had a lot of engineers, a lot of, uh, we, 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 you know, all of us were energetic and let's, let's do something. So we did a lot of projects that were not on the books that later became projects just because we had the, the knowledge, we had the toys to play with. Because we put everything we get, we put it on the pole. Right. And this is a funny story. We had um, some, you know, the Nellis uh, running range surrounds Area 51. And it's just a big no-fly zone. And on their maps, it's a big square. They called it the, the box, the right. Air Force guys. They said a lot of names, but that's what they called it. So we had a, one day one of the, uh, Pilot, he decided he'd land on that long airstrip. You know, they could all see it down there. And he landed, and and nothing happened, really. And he got back and said, Boy, that's neat. You ought to see that place. So another one landed, F 105. <laughs> we, kept the, we kept the pilot for two weeks debriefing him, but we wouldn't let us have their plane back. And we actually put it on the pole, on the <laughs> pylon, and sent a photograph of <laughs> Nellis, here's your plane. And that stopped the emergency flights. Yeah, I would think so. so. Yeah. But but we, that's what we started doing is, is we, you know, when we did the MIGs, we put the MIGs on the Right, on I wanted to ask you about that because it wasn't just looking at our aircraft. That was no, we started, anything we got our hands on, we, we realized that every plane gave a different radar uh, signature. And that really became a project. They came out of boredom, us, hey, let's put that thing on the post. Well, there's like, so we had time on our hands. Yeah, because you did everything from the MiG-21, the MiG-17, these were, premier Soviet fighter aircraft in oh, Vietnam and even beyond that we, I can't imagine how good the intelligence from understanding these aircraft from an electronic the, intelligence point of view. The kill ratio nine, uh, in, in Vietnam at the time was 9 to 1 against us. And the, the Russians came out with the new MiG-21 fish bed. And we thought it was the plane. And uh, of course, the Iraqi defected to Israel with a brand new MiG-21. We got our hands on it in January 1968. And the first thing we did was tore it down, see how they built it, did a technical uh, evaluation of it, and then we uh, flew it. And on the first try, the Navy came in. The Navy was more interested in the Air Force. You know, the Air Force was running the flight dynamic, I mean, the uh, uh, Ford Technology Division out of Wright Patterson was heading up the testing part of it. 
and the but the Navy had was losing more planes. But they came in and flew against the MiG-21, and on the first flight, we got a 100% kill against the Navy. Within two months, they started uh, Top Gun. Mm -hmm. they, they realized it's not the planes. Our, it's just our people don't know how to fight. Right. And, we, and what we realized is it take a, a pilot in Vietnam probably 10 missions before he learned enough about the, the way they fought and, and the planes that he might survive the war. We decided let's give those pilots those 10 missions in Nevada rather than Vietnam. And that's exactly what we did. And then the, the uh, Air Force started the, the red flag exercise. Right, right, which is right here. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then we actually uh, established a, a squadron of MiGs at Tonopah where they fly against the real thing. And the guy at Tonopah would actually play the Russian national anthem so they would fight like a Russian rather than American. Right. You know, expose the guys to the real thing. And we'd actually send people off to um, Samoya was one of our training places. They they were trained by the Russians and they'd fly in the, the Russian MiG-21s. And they got crossways with the Russians, so we'd go in and our pilots actually flew with them and learned the tactics that they had been trained to, to fight like a Russian. Right, which is very different. I mean, in the Army we have the National Training Center where people, we dress up American vehicles to look like Russian ones. Exactly. They certainly do the same tactics. Top Gun, they take American aircraft that have, or Allied aircraft that have similar characteristics, perhaps. But Tonopah is literally, these are MiG-21s, right? right? These are Russian aircraft, the real the, thing. The, the real thing. We yeah. had we had two MiG-17s that we got. When uh, we got a lot of stuff from, from Israel during the Six-Day War. They right. They captured on the battlefield. And that's where we got a lot of our radar. That's not, that one of my specialties, was Soviet radar. We got them. We needed, as we developed in stealth, we need to know what the Russians were going to see. So we had to use their equipment to look at what we were doing. Right. So we got our hands on a lot of the Soviet radar and the, and um, a couple of Syrians landed on the wrong airstrip during the Six Day War. So that's how we got our hands on, on the MiG-17s. Well, I mean, it's, it's a lot more than just understanding their radar because of fighting them. It's also understanding their radar because of actually manufacturing new aircraft and kind of tactics. I mean, I remember the story, the B-1 was developed to fly in low because we found out later on that the Russian look down radar was essentially non-existent. It was crap. Yeah. And so that kind of intelligence coming in not only helps us fight a war, but it also helps us to develop and procure and create new tactics and everything else, how important that is mm. for fighting. Yeah. You know what's interesting is the DIA was almost as involved as CIA was, or maybe more so. Mm -hmm. There's a different role. They, they dealt with the countries. In fact, they, they're the ones that made the deal with the with the Israel for the, the MiGs and that sort of thing. They're just now starting to declassify all of that. Mm -hmm. well, it was a CIA facility, and, but the DIA was one that brought them in, and the Air Force did the managed the, the scheduling in the flights, and that sort of thing, them in the, in the Navy. So it was a, a, a group effort. Did you want, so this, there's a very famous story about the CIA sort of disinformation campaign about keeping Area 51 secret. I'm not going to talk about aliens, don't worry. Yeah. Um, but the concept of kind of letting that stupidity go instead of stepping in and saying no, no, no right. was pretty ingenious. It was. The yeah. idea of yeah. let people chase flying saucers because then they won't be looking for the X. Yeah, they look ridiculous, you know, and then yeah. they really see someone, something, they're not, no one's going to believe them anyway. Right. I, did you understand when you were there that kind of the, the mystique of Area 51 or what it would become, kind of that not really. I think that we, most of us out there had worked on classified projects before. And uh, and it was just something we were re real proud to be doing. What we knew we was doing a lot of good. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it, But, you know, we regret now we didn't take photographs. Of course, we couldn't at the area. But even out at the lake, we just didn't take, we just didn't take photographs and that sort of thing. In fact, mm -hmm. I'll tell you, uh, while I was on the NASA high range, uh, one of the we, there's 15 flights, the engine didn't uh, ignite. He had land on Mud Lake up at Tony Paul. So they went in and, and got the S-15, put it on a flatbed, and got us Ford Beatty where we were living, that's where the radar site was. Was week is Friday, late Friday, and the trucks are not allowed to cross Death Valley on weekends. So the truck was sitting in my driveway all weekend with the S-15 <laughs> on it. I didn't take, I didn't take a single photo Just. 
I didn't take a center, single photo of the X-15 sitting in my driveway. In your driveway. We I, just didn't think about it. It wasn't a big deal. Right. Well, I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? You look oh, back and like, man, anybody. I should have taken a picture well, of that. I just like the radar side of Beatty. Uh, spent years there. Never threw, I don't have a single photograph of her then. I mean, in, of me and it or any of the people. We got some that NASA took, but we don't have, you know, our own, own photographs. Did you work closely with the engineers who actually were creating these aircraft? Like, was there a, a conversation with, like, when you did the when we did the, the radar cross section for the for the A twelve, did you go back to Kelly Johnson and team and be like, here's what it looked like and here's how you you know? Yeah, yeah, we yes, they they had in fact that we we did all the data processing on it and uh, not only the radar but the data and everything. Yes. What, how much of a collaborative process was that? I mean, that, that's it. It seemed like it was somewhat siloed. It wasn't much. Yeah. You didn't really. T you didn't. Just certain people could talk to each other. Right. And uh, uh, I don't. I'm not. Even, I'm not even sure who talked to to the engineer. That wasn't me. Yeah. Uh, that, that did that. They. Well, I think. I think probably it was um, uh, Jim Friedman. This is the. Uh, no one knew exactly what we all did. Right. Uh, even though it was there, you know, you did things in your own little room. But Jim Friedman, and this is kind of funny when they were just a few years ago, they, but I think it was Danny Jacobs was interviewing uh, Colonel Slater, the commander. And, and Jim w was mentioning that he was the one that would pick up the CIA dispatches from Langley out of McCarran. I think it was Frontier Airline was bringing them in. And then, and then, uh, the evening, then he would go by Warner Weiss's office, the the CIA commander, and pick up the dispatches going back. Slater had no idea, and him and Warner were just they were just as close as brothers. Hmm. He had no idea that of of, of of someone was picking up the dispatches and going back and forth. He just didn't have a need to know. Well, it's a question about how mu how much did you know? You mentioned that people didn't know CIA was necessarily involved, and certain people didn't. Were you fully cognizant that CIA was your customer? I was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And but, but that was because you were part of the cadre. Was but everyone else wasn't necessarily. No. no. Because I'd worked for them before. There was five of us that were special. Uh, they kept, and we were the ones that flew the Queen Air. And, mm -hmm. and the uh, we CIA went. You know when they formed the Science Technology Division in 1962. Well, they um, at the time they. They weren't really that active, hadn't made a business out of Area 51. It was just A-12. But by 1968, they saw that they were into stealth. The CIA said, we're going to continue after, after, after Oxcart. It's gone. Mm -hmm. We're going to stay here. For, and they stayed for another 10 years. And a lot of people wondered what they had they been doing for 10 years that no one knew about. But we were doing the stealth and... and uh, and, and things like that. And the, was that working on some of the, like the Hab Blue stuff? Or, Hab, Hab Blue. We which had becomes the F-117. All kind of, pro, we, we did a lot of prototypes that never sold a lot of day. Mm -hmm. They were strictly uh, technology demonstrators, just to see uh, what, what would, how they'd work. And that well, how much of that was to try to develop American technology, and how much of it was that try to prepare ourselves for what other countries might be developing? Uh, we, let's well, take the tall king radar. For example, that I talked about in Cuba, well, we immediately built our own talking radar, so that we didn't have to fly the A-12 over Cuba or someplace to see if, if our ECM and whatever was working. Well, that became a practice out there, and it, and it became a laboratory. The CIA made it into a laboratory where someone come out with something new. Say, Texas Instrument came out with a pod to go on B-52 for some purpose. Well, they didn't, against something in China or Russia, where, well, they didn't have to fly to the foreign country to test it. They flew to Area 51 and they fly over. And that was just, you know, we had everything there. That became, we, we actually became a business. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we actually called them customers. Anyone outside of our group was a customer. Even the CIA could be a customer if they came in with something that was off the wall. Right, was it, I, we, we skipped over this. It was important to, that you work for a contractor. Yeah. Now, you weren't a CIA employee necessarily. No. This is all through the contractor, just the same way the Nevada nuclear test site mm -hmm. is run by contractors. So you work for one as well. Yeah, everyone 
was classified as working for the CIA for the per for a, a reason. Nevada had a state law that anyone, any contractors working in the state over 30 days or something had to get a, a, a card, work, work card for their employees and mm. that sort of thing because of the gambling and all that. Right. So the way they, they got around it, they said everybody works for the CIA, works for the government. So that we hid under that umbrella. And, but we reported directly to the CIA. Right. Uh, we did not report any, uh, any of the company people, any, the company boss. Either we worked for uh, EG and G. We didn't report G, EG and G management. We reported directly to whoever was assigned to us in the CIA. Right. Was e even though EG and G is one of the most highly cleared contractors, yeah. I mean they were involved in every single program, especially a lot of the early nuclear stuff. So they certainly had the clearance. But this is as need to know as it but gets. The need yeah. to know, and the uh, and then what the and then 1968 when they started moving out the A12. Oshkard, and they, they, cut, they cut down the, all the forces they had there. The CIA at that point told the EG&G, we don't want any more of your test site people. We won't, we won't pick our own people. We're gonna have, they'll still be working for you, but we're going to recruit them. Mm -hmm. so that's another thing a lot of people don't know. The CIA, didn't, when they were recruiting for Oshkard in particular, they didn't trust the FBI enough to let them do the security clearance that they did their own clearances. And they, it, it, Which is rare. I mean, that's yeah. the, most. I mean, even for case officers, they mm -hmm. they use the FBI or OPA. But they did not. But, it, but the um, but you know the U two program that Acrotone was more highly classified than the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. Another thing came up in the, this is really recent. In last August, uh, one of the U two pilots, Tony Bravacra, and I were invited back to the Def Defense Intelligence Agency to sit on a panel. Well, he was Air Force. We trained him at Area Fifty One on the U two. But he was Air Force. He never flew for the CIA. So during the course of the panel, he talked about how he got recruited. I sit there listening. It was so different mm -hmm. from the CIA. And uh, and, and uh, one thing they had in common is all the pilots had been F-84 pilots at, at Turner Air Force Base. And all of a sudden, well, Gary Powers actually bunked with, with Tony. Mm -hmm. One day, Tony, uh, Gary wasn't there anymore. And they started disappearing. And, and and then Tony got when he arrived at Area 51, he found out where they were. Right. Here they were, and they couldn't talk to him because they were CIA by this time. Oh. And they still they couldn't talk to him. But anyway, uh, so, I, so when he got through, I mentioned uh, about how they selected the CIA pilot. I said, you know, the, the cover was high altitude weather testing for NASA. But I, actually, almost all of the first class were already flying out to the Nevada test site. They fly in the F-84s through the atomic bomb test. Mm -hmm. he, Tony had never heard of that. So then he ran it by General, Major General Pat Halloran, a friend of ours, that also flew the F-84. He'd never heard of it. They had never heard about their fellow pilots that they bunked with at Turner was flying through a atomic bomb test. But that's something we had in common with the, with the atomic bomb program was our pilots flew out there. Right. Well, I mean, again, geographically, if people on the East Coast or other where don't understand the geography of Nevada, it's Groom Lake and the, the, the Nevada test site are essentially, mm -hmm. you, you, you can accidentally go from one to the other. You don't know if you're on one or the other. It's basically just desert. So, yeah, there probably was a lot of overlap there. Um, that had to have been uh, somewhat bittersweet when Oxcart was, ro was rolled up. I know that you went on and did a lot of work afterwards with that. Um, but just as far as an engineering kind of just it's yeah there's no I mean the aircraft is just so it's perfection in, it, in, it was and um, one of my things they brought me out there um, they were trying to get this is not part of Oshkart but they were using Oshkart vehicle before they left to get Mark three RCS with the flying over with the radar well they had a heck of a time you know if they didn't pick up that plane and it's on the horizon it'd be coming in so fast that the radar couldn't physically slew fast enough in altitude right. to ever, ever capture it, you know. Well, they, um, of course, I was used to tracking missiles before I, while I was in the Army, and then I tracked thousands of them out of White Sands, which are fast, and then I was on the X-15, which was almost Mark 7, twice as fast as the A-12. Mm -hmm. So they rushed me out there and brought in, we went to, uh, 
McGregor Range down by El Paso and picked up one of my Nike radars that I had trained in in the Army and brought it out there. That became our primary radar. And, that, and so we, we managed to get some uh, Mark III radar cross sections. But that was for st the benefit of stealth. The CIA was already looking ahead. That wasn't even part of our chart. Mm -hmm. They just used, there's an the opportunity. Let's get it what we can. How much of that was to develop countermeasures against other people's stealth? I'm sorry. How much of working on stealth was to try to develop countermeasures to other countries working on stealth? I mean, I mean, we didn't, we didn't do much of that. No, no, no. We were so far ahead of everybody else. We when were in technology. What's funny is that, you know the, the stealth technique came from Russia. Yeah, you know, the, the, well, so did a lot of the titanium. Yeah, the titanium the actual, too. Uh, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the A12. Which is a fantastic story if you get a chance that that that. All the front companies that were created to buy titanium from the Soviets to build the uh, the A twelve and the SR seventy one. Um, what was was there a moment at Area fifty one or even at the Nevada High Range where you kind of just stopped and said you were amazed, or it was just like I, I know you, you kind of got a little bit jaded might be the wrong word, where it just kind of seen so much stuff it became kind of ho hum. Like you said, Area fifty one was boring, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people out there are gonna be like. Area 51 is boring, but was there a time where your jaw just dropped, where you just could not believe, that you can talk about, mm -hmm. that you could not kind of believe what you were seeing? It did, uh, particularly with, with the stealth. That was a very interesting project. Uh, you know, we went through a lot of try, trial and error. We got it where the radar alerting that the plane couldn't see it. Yeah. But it's reflecting it. It'd be you have radar here on another hill or something. It's picking up the signal. Right. So we had to address all those sort of things, you know. And so that was quite a, a challenge to come up with a true stealth plane. And we made the A twelve about about ninety percent stealth. Well, it helps when it flies as fast as it yeah. does. Also. Yeah. And speed. Well, right. there's no way it, it carried eighty thousand pounds of fuel. There's no way you'd hide eighty thousand pounds of fuel from radar. Well, and you're not. Gonna and and then temperature. Right. Thermal. You're not going to be able yeah, to hide. Thermal. Inches, you know, yeah. The, the temperature flew actually, you know, the, around the uh, air intake, it gets as high as 2200 degrees. Windshield 800, and it was, just, it was a hot plane. Right. How much, how much did you cross purpose with what NASA was doing? Or was it completely siloed? No, we, we, we really worked together with NASA quite a bit, the designers, because we were doing the XB 70, which was a Mark III plane also, a bomber. Mm -hmm. And Is that it, the Valkyrie? Yeah. Yeah. And it used a honeycomb type skin, whereas Lockheed was um, using the titanium. And they compared a lot of notes and on the engines and just a lot of comparison back and forth between North America and, and, and Lockheed on that as, they, as mm -hmm. they developed that. It's amazing there's some of these, these gorgeous aircraft that never really see the light of day. I mean, the, the XB-70 is a great example of this. We're just... Some engineer somewhere was able to design the pr some of the prettiest aircraft ever made. They oh. just didn't necessarily fly as well as they should. I love that XB-70 program. I was on it from the day, first flight, and they, uh, and it, and that was kind of a funny story. They, uh, you know, it was kind of a joint NASA Air Force project, and uh, but NASA, I mean, the Air Force wouldn't give NASA the beacon code when it first started flying. And so we had to skin track it. Well, we, at, at, as far as Beatty, we, unless you got very high, we couldn't, didn't have a good skin track. They tracked it at Edwards, but not, but not up range. And uh, we kept trying to get a lot of jealousy between NASA and the Air Force on that. And, but the Air Force was having a problem with their radar. They couldn't maintain lock for some reason. It, it's just, they're going through all kinds of difficulties with it. Well, my, my radar operator at, at Beatty had worked at the Cape, and that's where our Mod 2 radar had come from. We used very antique radar, by the way. And one day was at the, at the bar at the Shane Club there at Beatty after a, a flight, and he banged down on the, the uh, bar and he said, I remember the code. He said, Air Force is notorious for never changing their code. So uh, next day we was having a mission, there should be 70. So they, uh, Bill, uh, Tuned in that code to the to the beacon, and we even with the the B seventy sitting on the ground at Edwards, uh, we could it triggered the beacon just like it, it almost saturates your receiver. Right. It, it is a 
big, big one. And he, he got it and he said, shall I, uh, we notify Edwards we got track and, uh, and uh, we said, no, I just wait a while. So Air Force just thumb along, thumb along, and, it, it, and this one have to board the mission, so uh, we said, I'll give Bill to go ahead. And he announced on the intercom to went all everywhere. Beatty radar, full auto track, 001, which was plain was fine. And I mean, the airway just got just as quiet as could be. And then the Norm Hayes down at Edwards, he said, Beatty, uh, you got radar track? Burn it, sir. We're tracking. So we went ahead and sold radar. We did the mission on one radar track, and that's ours at Beatty. We fired that beacon because the Air Force dropped, kept dropping off and everything. And they, and I think about two missions later, they took off at Palmdale and land, landed at Dryden. NASA took over from the Air Force. Mm. And, uh, but it was, but it was shy fun for them. The Air Force just wouldn't give, wouldn't share with us. I mean, I, I can understand the need for security and compartmentalization, but these are all overlapping programs. Yeah. CIA, NASA, Air Force. It's always been that way. It's yeah. such a shame so much what money wasted hiding technology. And, and it's the same way with your intelligence. Right. You know, Truman hated, well, everybody hated the CIA or OSI. And, and uh, what, what they dissolved, dissolved, uh, dissolved all the intelligence. A war at, a right. month after the World War II ended. Right, OSS was dissolved. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's always been a, a struggle. Yeah, I mean, it, and it, but looking at, especially going to the 1960s when I became so absolutely fundamental to know what was happening inside the Soviet Union and it really was overhead reconnaissance and geospatial intelligence that was going to be the solution to this because our human intelligence assets were non-existent. It's sad though that there was still this kind of compartmentalization of information and, and parochialism within these different organizations. The battles that went on between CIA and Air Force behind the scenes over the U2. Yeah. Just, it's just amazing and uh, it reminds me of, of uh, General uh, Gibbs, he was uh, Dick Bissell's right-hand man, his deputy, and it ruined his military career. They, right. After he went back into the Air Force, they wouldn't have anything to do with him, and you know he never, never made another star. And uh, uh, another was, was Doug Nelson. He was the colonel at the time, and and LeMay sent him to March Air Force Base to spy on the U-2 program when it started. But Doug liked the U-2 program, and he became a got where he wouldn't report back to. To uh, the May, which is the I mean, if you think about it logically, and I know we're looking at it in hindsight, but LeMay's strategic air command depended on knowing where Soviet strategic missiles were, mm -hmm. and the U two was providing that information. Yeah. So LeMay should love the U two because it's allowing him to develop targeting packages for mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. and yet it's this parochialism, this kind of they're getting more money than we are for things that yeah. we should be doing. Yeah. That, that cause I, I wonder what would have happened again this is kind of a counterfactual what would have happened if people had worked together at this point and how exactly the, the redundancy we would have avoided the money we would have saved you know what was interesting too you know we were talking about the, the Cuban thing when we de detected the, um, the, the evaluating the talking mm -hmm. well we, we we detected that they had a talk this radar in the first place it's reflections off of ICBMs being flown inside of Russia so after we got through with the Cuban thing, we actually put a, a big antenna right outside of Morgantown, New Jersey, right off the turnpike, aimed it at the moon, and just a matter of weeks, we had pinpointed every radar site in Russia, just from refle reflections, reflections off, the off the moon. Well, that's interesting. This is a great. Yeah, you're you're too young maybe to have worked on BMUs. Yeah. Well, when they fired that thing up, they thought we were under full attack because they picked up the moon rising over yeah. the horizon. It's wonderful to hear those, those almost not almost disasters, but those early engineering mess ups because mm -hmm. we learn so much from mistakes. And I think that's really what kind of Area Fifty One was designed to do was to learn from to have a place to screw up, yeah, and to have the money to the, screw we, up and the freedom to screw up. We we had a lot of what we called OS moments, yeah, and the uh, I, I a little funny thing when we did got, doing the Big Twenty One actually. We had, put it back together and before we flew it was want to do an evaluation of the engine. The engine had 125 hours on it, brand new engine. And well, by Russian standards, it was, you know, because it was a throwaway. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't rebuild them like we do. 
But anyway, they, we tied the plane down for the military uh, power. The brakes wouldn't really hold it with that engine at full power, you know. So we tied it down and we was going to start our engine test. Everybody and their dog wants to watch this, watch this MiG-21 test. And someone noticed their film badges. You know, we, we carry on our security badges, we carried those amateurs mm -hmm. and film badges. It's just loaded with junk. Someone said, hey, we better gather up our, these film badges. Someone was like, we'll get their badge search for the engine. So we gathered up all the film badges, about 25 of them. And we, and I always like to tell them, we gave it to Gomer Powell. <laughs> that we just just sitting there screaming, you know, and then those planes are tugging, and then Gomer gets right up in front of it. Golly. He sucked every one of our badges through the engine. We hadn't even got to fly the plane yet. <laughs> and we had to have it back to Israel in two months because they were going to use it for some kind of celebration back there. And fortunately, some of the Pratt Whitney guys built the J-58 for the, for the Blackbirds was still on the site. And they tore it down and polished out the dings and stuff and got it flyable again. But that's one of those moments, oh, God, what are we doing? Well, I remember the, one of the first, uh, and this is, again, probably before you were there. It was way before you were there. This was the U-2 pilot. But they just did a taxi test for the U-2. And it took off by accident. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, again, that's where Area 51 allows you to do these things that you can't do anywhere else because you're there to screw up, really. I mean, that's you're learning from the mistakes, and that's what the, you want to try to do. Hank, Hank Martyr, who was one of the IP out there for the YouTube, was one of my best friends. And, and um, he talked about, talk about how they would go up, and every flight they broke the world's altitude record and couldn't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. But they, would, they didn't have any manuals at that time, no dash ones, and they didn't have any simulators. So they'd try stuff, and they'd come back in and say, man, don't try this, it'll get you killed, you know? yeah. And they wrote the books. But you got to admire those pilots. They, they, uh, all the pilots that flew, those different things at Area 51, the bird of prey, the tack at blue, you know, the proof of concept planes that, yeah. I wonder if this thing will fly, let's find out. And they hop aboard and here they go, you know. Well, sorry, the test pilots there in Edwards were basically their job was to do things no one else had ever done oh, yeah. before and to see if it worked or it killed them. Yeah, Joe Walker was one of my best friends. You know, got killed in the, in the, um, the uh, mid-air with, right. uh, with the Valkyrie XP-70. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I got to tell you a story that uh, might be of interest. Uh, when I, I got the Bayer radar, uh, a Bayer tracker station, I noticed, on, you know, we, we plotted the, um, uh, course and altitude and everything, or the whatever we're flying, mainly the X-15, on a, on a X-5 plotter, big, big old plotter. And and the, you had three ra radar sites. You had one at Edwards, you had one at Beatty, one at Ely. And it's all ganged together. And watch, whichever one was provided the best data is one that they would use as the primary. Well, anytime that would uh, switch over from Edwards to switch over to Beatty, or, or switch to Ely or whatever, there was a 2,000 foot jump in altitude. So I, uh, it concerned me and, and I noticed that uh, Beatty radar always agreed with altitude being reported by the B-52 and the F-15, right, right to the foot. And, but the other two always had this little jump. So mm -hmm. I mentioned it to the, um, uh, Edwards one day, I said, you know, we got a problem here. We, I'm seeing a 2,000 foot jump in, uh, altitude on all these flights and the uh, operator down there said well that's the inherent problem we've always had that it, it just ignore it well i'm in there at hell you know because i see when when uh, edwards would lock on the beef uh, anything sitting on the ground tarmac at edwards it's short at 2,000 feet right which is problematic when you're low to the ground so right? one so one day they uh, uh the number three um Bird was going to overhaul, and the B-70 wasn't going to be flying. We had about a week or so of downtime. So I just got on the, the uh, uh, horn, and, and our communications went to White Sands, went to Vandenberg, it went everywhere. And, and so I got on there, and I called up my counterpart at uh, uh, Edwards, and I said, you know, this, we've got some downtime. This is a good time for us to fix your and Ely's radar problems. The boy got quiet. And he's tried to shut me off and that, and each side had a NASA employee as a monitor. Mm -hmm. We worked on incentive type projects. So, you know, he, uh, and he stepped out and he gave me the thumbs up, you know, he knew what I was going to do. 
And then I said, John, I said, no, it's not an inherent, there's no such thing as an inherent problem in radar. I said, you've got a 2,000 foot error in your, in Ely's radar. And you can't tell a pilot when he's within 2,000 foot of the ground. I said, you're gonna kill someone. Yeah. He tried to shut me up and he said, well, it's Beatty's radar problem. And I said, no, it's not. He said, well, but mine and Ely's agree. He, I said, that doesn't make any difference. You're 2,000 foot off. Beatty is the only radar that's working right. Right, but you were, the radar was the same as when the aircraft. Right? Yes, yeah. exactly. So he tried to shut me up, and this was going into the pilot's room. Joe Walker was in the, in the pilot's lounge. And when he tried to shut me off on it, Joe got on there, and he said, affected me, there'll be no more flights on the NASA high range until this is fixed. So they worked for about two weeks. They tore the radar down. They put them back together. Probably, they finally found what it was, was a field engineering modification that came out in 1940s, where actually they built a plant, uh, radar, and they had applied it to the one in the, in the um, at Beatty, but the other two radars had never got modified. So it had been two decades, and they had been yeah, modified. all this yeah. time. And uh, but they fished them. Yeah. And, and uh, of course, I got a became station manager, and the uh, uh, company got a big bonus. Uh, uh, for that for that quarter, because the way we worked on NASA range, the the contractor was given X number of dollars for each quarter. And then every time you screwed up, and this could be anything like buying, not going to the cheapest vendor for your tires for the trucks or or a vehicle, anything they do knock it knock it off, you know, yeah. and you actually end up owing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how the contract we worked under, and um, so we got a big bonus set because of that when you probably saved some wives at edwards i mean i, because, I would think so yeah because, i mean they, they, the proverbial envelope i mean they pushed every limit you possibly could and i can imagine two thousand foot difference it, in the radar is problematic it was funny though the the um the side manager when i i didn't even check it with him because i knew he, he was too weak to ever address anything like that and boy he whirled around he was in the same room with me he said boy he just cleared he said you're on your own but the NASA guy came out and gave me yeah. the thumbs up. I knew I was on solid ground. But because I was right. Right. And it was a safety issue more than yeah. anything. Yeah. Well, T.D. Barnes uh, is the president of the Roadrunners International. He, he is an author, a prolific one. And you can find a lot of what he's written on multiple websites. But the one that has some great information is td-barnes.com. There's also a much longer website, area51specialprojects.com slash barnes slash area51, which gives... A lot of the story that we just talked about you know, in a written form. So, TD, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us here at SpyCast. We truly appreciate it. It's fun. Thank you.